This show is sponsored by Den 10 Insurance Services, helping businesses get the right insurance for all their insurance needs. Visit den10.io to get a quote. D E N T E N.io. And remember, when you buy an insurance policy from Den 10, you're giving back on a global scale. Hello, all my entrepreneurs and business leaders, and welcome to the Michael Esposito Show, where I interview titans of industry in order to inform, educate, and inspire you to be great. My guest today has built a business on the foundation of relationships. He spends his time cultivating relationships and creating value for any who interact with him. His business, Click Knowledge, focuses on helping businesses and business owners find more time through documenting processes and creating plans for others to follow. This helps company culture, which in turn creates strong relationships. Please welcome my guest and friend, Jason Helferbaum. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Welcome. So this is always really cool for me. I was, um, I've been doing these uh, Instagram lives every morning now. I've been doing this since February 2nd, Groundhog's Day. And it was kind of like, because I did it on Groundhog's Day because it was like complete, it was repeating over and over and over again that I needed to do this. So I finally on Groundhog's Day, I was like, I got to stop the cycle. That's, that's literally <laughs> how, how the uh, Instagram live started. It was like, I got to stop the cycle. I'm doing it today. And, uh, and this morning I did one and I was talking about, I always talk about on Fridays, my, my, uh, show here at at iHeart and I'm like how fortunate I am and how cool it is. And I was like, what's really cool is my show's like an international show now. You're up in Canada. Uh I mean, you're, you're in Canada. Another person I had on was in Canada, Bob. And, uh, I had somebody in India, so it's, it's really cool. It's so exciting for me when I have a guest on that's from a whole other continent, a whole other country. It's so cool. So, so tell me, um, how, how did things start for you early on in your journey as an entrepreneur? You know, I, I think it's kind of funny. I think I was not an entrepreneur for a long time. Uh, I, you know, I think you hear all these stories, these guys who are like very entrepreneurial from like six, seven years old. I probably wasn't entrepreneurial into my twenties. I was very much a latent entrepreneur, but once I started, I couldn't stop. Mm. You know, I, I really, I, I heard a quote once, which doesn't resonate for me to, to the large extent, but maybe for some people, uh, it was someone who said, I can't be managed. I can only be frustrated. Huh. And, and I don't quite follow it to that extent, but I, I think sort of once I got a taste of charting my own destiny, I couldn't look back. You know, it's sort of the, the genie came out of the bottle and I realized there's certain things I want to do. And I really wanted to affect change in people. Mm. Yeah, I you know, it's it's interesting that that kind of, I would say I, I also feel the same way about this whole like late entrepreneur, except I was much older <laughs> uh, for me. I, you know, I worked in the corporate setting for years and it wasn't until what, like two years ago that I was like, I'm going to go off on my own. Um, but I think that there's little things along the way, like breadcrumbs of being an entrepreneur that I can look back in my story and say, you know what? I did try to start a business. You know, I was working at a job. But I did start, a, I remember my very first year actually at Yellow Book back in 2006, I had had, a, yeah. had several meetings with my, my cousin and a really close friend to the point where we actually met with an accountant and we were developing this like online business together. So I guess where I'm going with that is I feel like even though for you it was until like your, your late 20s, 30s that you became an entrepreneur, but I feel like there's like little breadcrumbs along the way. And I'm, I'm interested to find out if, if there's anything like that you could think back on that, that you can look and go, you know what, that was like a breadcrumb for me. Yeah, it's pretty funny you say that. And, and I'll comment on that in a different way. In thinking, I didn't really see the breadcrumbs, but you know, for myself personally, I don't like to sort of draw that line in the sand and make it black and white. You're either an entrepreneur or you're not. Mm. Um, one thing I wish I had done more of it when I was younger was had mentors. Mm. And regardless if you're an entrepreneur or not, I think mentorship is really important. 
And so I'm really encouraging my kids now to, you know, get involved, meet people, get a taste of what it is. And, and people are so happy and anxious to give back. Uh, and just tell you a quick anecdotal story. There was my daughter, one of my daughters is moving into tech and I'm a member of a tech organization and they have different meetups and stuff like that. And so I encouraged her to join and hang out. And she asked a few questions and they sort of kibitz with me and kid with me. And they say, you know what? Your daughter asks better questions than you. Let's have her come instead of you from now on because <laughs> she's much better than you. But and, and everyone laughed. But the point is, is she got that entree into the, uh, all these people who are willing to give back to her. And so, you know, whether you label yourself as an entrepreneur or not, I would I would really highly encourage everyone to have a mentor. And the truth is, is I try to view every person I meet as a mentor. And in full disclosure, sometimes it's how to live and sometimes it's how not to live. Mm, yeah. And, you know, it's funny about the kids, though, is uh, when you said that she asked better questions. W one, we, we know that they're kind of joking to kind of like, you know, kind of give you some a good ribbing of sorts and it's yeah. kind of like just a way of, of building camaraderie sometimes. But, you know, I, I am interested in the question part because I think that kids do ask really good questions. And I think it's because they're willing to just um, be careless or uh, carefree, I mean to say, about whether uh, what others think of them, right? Where it's, you know, you're thinking, yeah. um, maybe I should know that, so I'm not going to ask the question. Whereas she's like, I, I don't know that. <laughs> and so I'm going to yeah. ask. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm guilty of that. You know, someone will ask you, say, like, do you know about so and so? And you really don't. And you feel uncomfortable saying, I don't know. Right. So you kind of go, yeah. And you hope they don't ask another question or, or anything like that. But to your point, you know, a good friend of mine um, who will rename, remain anonymous um, has done very, very well in business and has always been very successful. Never really known failure. And I remember I was walking with him once and my, at the time, I think eight-year-old son was just dancing like an absolute idiot. And he looked at him, started to smile and said, I wish I could do that. And I said, do what? He says, dance like an idiot and not really care what people think. Mm. And I said, well, why don't you? He says, well, because I can't look bad in front of everyone. I've always succeeded. I can't have that failure. Wow. And I think to go back to the original thing, I think the reason why we're not as curious, we don't ask as many questions is because we want to look bad and we don't want to fail right. or be perceived as failing. And, it, and it's, I think it's changing the entrepreneurial world as we understand failure is a good thing. Mm. But, but I think we really need to embrace failure more. Right. And, and, and to that point, you know, like, Whenever we're doing an engagement, when I'm talking to my clients, when we're talking internally, uh, one of the mantras we have is to check the ego at the door. And, and what we therefore do is when we have a post-mortem or a discussion or a strategic chat, it's all about direction and ideas as opposed to who said it and who's right and who's wrong. Um, and to that end as well, it's great because we can have a conversation with our clients where we can say, hey, we messed up. Mm -hmm. We're going to fix it. And here's why we messed up. And there's no shame or embarrassment. It's just like, yeah, no one's perfect. Mm. Right? I, I like the embracing failure. I think it's, um, you know, there's, I, I just, again, my my IG, these IG lives, I mean, they're part of my life. They're every morning now. Uh, I, I just did one on Walt Disney. And I didn't know this about Walt Disney. I knew that there was some failures in his in his existence, and that's why I had looked him up for this um, IG Live that I was doing on on failure. And I didn't realize that you know he had gone through bankruptcies, he had gone through a mental breakdown, he had gone through uh, just a bunch of things, a strike, and all sorts of different things. But yet, it's like he's Walt Disney, and it's Disneyland, and it's all these amazing things. And I I think that you know when we can embrace failure and learn from it, there's, there's so much more that we can do. Um, in your experience, what kind of failures have you experienced that you can share, of course, and that you've, you've really learned from and have seen maybe propel you and your business or even your family or your community forward? You know what? I mean, I'm trying to think of something. I'm not trying to hold back, but I'll, I'll tell you, like, for example, arguably every day I fail as a father, I fail as a husband, 
but you know you you don't like you fail in the sense that you're not at the optimal level you want to be but you know to speak just to speak to that for a minute it, it's i think that's the problem is we see failure as all or nothing mm-hmm. you did it or you didn't and and some kind of times that is the case right sometimes you sort of do need to be black and white that way uh, but i think it's not so absolute i think in some cases failure is just being not optimal and going back on and you know getting back on that horse um i would say you know also just you know without going into too much detail i would say from my sales and marketing perspective you know what i thought was going to be successful what made so much sense on paper was great and when you actually executed it realized it wasn't going to work and so you don't sort of crumple up that paper and say screw it you sort of look at the metrics and say okay what worked what didn't work why did it work why did it not and you go to version 2.0 mm. you know like, like uh, reed hoffman who founded linkedin had a great quote i think that's applicable in life he said if you go back and look at your first release of your product and you don't cringe you release too late I I actually I, I used to listen to one of his podcasts and I I feel like he says that pretty often because I kind of remember that of like if if you look back and you don't feel like there's anything to fix then yeah you, you didn't you didn't release properly or something he's it's very interesting um, that perspective I I really appreciate it uh, in terms of the sales and marketing I, I think that that's something that can really help our our audience here when you when you think about some of the mistakes that you made and of course they're in context to what you do and the services you offer um i'm interested in what those looked like for you sure i mean i'll share a recent mistake for you as you said and i and i thank you for that compliment i really do see myself as a relationship oriented person um and for example you know we talk about linkedin i I think there's this big distinction between a connection and a relationship um, and just to get up on that soapbox for half a second, most yeah. people on LinkedIn are about connections, not about relationships. Mm-hmm. And it can be frustrating when you're trying to have a relationship with someone who just wants to be a connection. Mm-hmm. But to that point, what I've found very effective is almost everyone I connect with, I invite to have a 15 minute chat. I, it's amazing what you can offer and what you can uncover within 15 minutes if both parties really want to get deep really quickly. Mm. And so I've had some amazing chats. And the lesson learned is this, is I would listen to someone, I would understand how I could help, I would make three, four, five introductions to them. And they'd be very grateful. And then they'd say, well, I'd love to help you. And and they'd say, great. And I explain what I do. And uh, they'd say, yeah, I can't think of anyone. Um, And so I realized I was sort of giving away the store for free. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the sense that, you know, if I have 10 connections to make for you, I'm more than happy to do them. But quite frankly, I'm only willing to make one or two if you, unless you're willing to reciprocate. And if you're willing to reciprocate, then there's more in that store. But, but that has to be earned as opposed to just be given away for free. Mm. The LinkedIn, the social media world, but specifically the LinkedIn world is is certainly a interesting place uh to form relationships uh speaking of of um of linkedin mm-hmm. here because you're you're 100 percent right it's it's so often I'm, I'm certainly guilty of it it's you know connections connections bring value i think or credibility to some extent for um for your persona online but it doesn't necessarily mean that you bring value <laughs> uh, so it's it's kind of like a, a weird balance um what so I, I like that you brought up the stra- your strategy of of making connections and having that fifteen minute chat and then they're and then you're connected and then you kind of know each other. I've done that too, where I put in my my calendar link and I've had a few people. I've, actually, I have a good interaction to share with you. I think I think many I think many will appreciate this. I actually so I, I put in my calendar link when I when I meet with people and, and I do the same thing like have this 15 minute chat because I'm like you I'm very relationship driven and I'm like you know you know what value can I offer you what value can you offer me you know you know why are we connected kind of thing right like why why does this make sense for us to be connected we both know that it helps our LinkedIn numbers great but why else does it make sense right so this this gentleman um, meets with me he puts his puts me on the calendar link. And I think I was like five minutes behind or whatever on, on the link, which, which by the way, I, I totally get like, you know, we're, when we're, when we're meeting with people, we, we need to be on time. 
But the reason why I was five minutes was behind was because I had just sent out a life application to a friend, but also a client, but he's also a friend. And he was calling me with some questions about it. And he was really kind of like, he was really in it. He was like really in the weeds, like concerned, like because he was getting the life policy because this was something that was very important um, to protect his family. And so he was really worried about how he was answering the questions. There was some medical stuff coming up and he was really, really worried. And so it wasn't one of those conversations where I could have just said, you know what? I got to call you back. I got a meeting right now. It was one of those conversations where you're a friend, you're also a client. I got to serve you right. And if it means that I just need to like Take five minutes, you know, shave it off. I'm sure whoever on the other end will understand that when I explain it, right? And yeah. and, and Jason's nodding along, so he agrees with me if you're listening. <laughs> um, so anyway, so so I show up to the meeting late. I show up five minutes late, and and I I still have my friend on the other line because I did have to. I did tell my friend. I said, listen, I got a meeting starting now, but I'm going to stay with you. Let me just explain to the other person that you know I'm going to jump back to you in a minute. So, uh, so I jump into the meeting and the person I could just tell is like fuming and I'm like, you know, all right, I get it. I, I understand that. Right. We just met for the first time. I'm five minutes late. I yeah. get it. And he says to me, I've been waiting 15 minutes. And I said, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought our meeting started at 11 o'clock. I'm just making up a time right now. Yeah. He goes, well, it did, but I'm on Lombardi time. And I went, What? <laughs> you know, Vince Lombardi being Vince famous Lombardi. for like, if you're, if you're not early, you're late. And you know, that could have been funny. That could have been a really great icebreaker for me being late and everything. And I tried to laugh it off with him. He wasn't laughing. So I, so I started explaining to him my case and I said, you know, um, you know, I was just working with a friend on his life app and everything. And he goes, Oh, you sell life insurance. And I said, well, yeah. And now I knew who I was meeting with. And I knew he sold life insurance. But to me, I don't view anybody as competition. I just look at it as another relationship of another person where maybe we could help each other out somewhere along the right. lines. And he goes, oh, you sell life insurance? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, I sell life insurance. We, we do um, you know, home and auto and life and business and everything. He goes, well, I don't see how this conversation is beneficial for either of us. <laughs> I was like... Yeah, neither do I, man. I was like, have a great yeah. day. We'll, we'll connect another time. And I'm just, you know, at the end of this, you know, the part of why I bring this up is you really learn, you know, like imagine this person's in my Rolodex now. And I've, I've kind of taken the dust off of that word Rolodex. I kind of, I've been using it in some of my emails. Um, I, uh, you know, you, you think about it. Now, imagine if, if I never met him and somebody said to me, hey, Michael, can you do this life policy? And I said, actually, I can't. But... I just got connected with this guy over, you know, who does this and I refer them and then they come back to me. They're going to be like, Michael, this guy was a jerk. <laughs> like, why'd you refer me? I didn't know him. Yeah. I was just connected with him. So I think it just brings in the whole value of, of relationships and getting to know somebody on a personal level, even if it's through LinkedIn, I think it is really, really important. Um, all that long story to only ask you another simple question along the lines here of, What's, what are some other ways or some other techniques that you use um, on LinkedIn, let's stay there for a minute, or, or on social media, to extend this relationship? Because as you, both, as you and I both know, not everybody takes us up on this 15-minute meeting, and it's very far and few between, quite honestly. So, I mean, specifically on social, how are you using social media to leverage that? Yeah, because you are very good on LinkedIn, actually. You know, I've 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 witnessed a lot of your um, LinkedIn like savviness by we've done that exchange of let's meet these different people, let's let's sit down together and go through contacts. I, I've I've done that with you, and and I've attended. The other thing we'll we'll get into in a second here is about your networking event that you put on your your service networking event. And I remember some of them came out of LinkedIn connections. So I feel that you do something more than just connecting through having a 15 minute get to know each other, you, you do a little bit more in terms of your messaging, in terms of how you like people's comments or posts. So I'm just interested if you could share some of that with our audience. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll share a secret weapon with you, so to speak. Uh, for those of you who are into networking, I'll tell you something really, really obvious um, that isn't so apparent. And actually, I'd say maybe 5% of the people I talk to do. It's if you have a 15 minute conversation, focus on them. Mm. If I have, when I have a 10 minute conversation, even with a prospect, 
I am doing very little talking for the first 10 minutes because I am making it about them. Everyone's favorite com topic of conversation is themselves, right? And so if I'm talking to what I would call a center of influence, and for those of you who are not familiar with the term, it's someone I'm not going to sell to, but they have access to people I would want to sell to. Um, if I'm talking to a center of influence or COI and I'm making it all about them, I'm building trust and I'm building a relationship with them and I'm understanding, you know, how I can be of service to them. And that's one of my mantras is how can I be of service? And just to expand upon that, it serves me really well because um, especially when I'm talking to a prospective client, if they understand I'm trying to just be of service to them, it means I'm not trying to sell them. Right. And, and if I'm talking to them and it comes out in conversation that they have issues with insurance, well, I obviously can't help them. And it may even be that they don't need me. But I'd say, you know what? Mike Esposito can help you. He's a great guy. I'm going to afford you his contact and let him know to expect a call from you, et cetera, et cetera. And people are at ease that way. And so if I have a 15 minute window and I'm spending 10 minutes talking about them, there's two things that are happening. Number one, they feel great. Number two, when those 10 minutes are up, it's human nature. They want to reciprocate. They want to know about me. And they're actively listening because they've been actively listened to. And I'm just saying this very matter-of-factly. I mean this in an integrous, not in a malicious way or a malintent way. As people are talking, I'm obviously gathering intel. And so as a result, I'm never pitching. I'm addressing what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if if rather than say, well, you need me because blah, 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 I don't know. But as I talk to them and I learn more about them, if I'm talking to COI, I can explain in 30 seconds based on what they said prior, why we're a strategic good fit and why it makes sense for you to introduce me to your clients. Mm -hmm. Right. And just to sort of just to put context to this and not to sort of um, try and sell. The first thing I do with prospects is I offer a complimentary consult. And right. So when I'm speaking to COI, what I'm leveraging is saying, look, I'm giving them something that would cost hundreds, maybe even thousands of dollars for free. And if you make that introduction, that is leveraging our relationship to make you look good in your colleagues, friends, customers eyes. So why would you not do that? Right. And similarly, I'm just saying matter of factly to someone I'm talking to, look, I want to offer this to you. So it ties back to being of service. It ties back to being in, in a relationship-oriented person and just getting to know the person mm -hmm. and just understanding how can I be of service to you. Yeah, it, it's it's something that I, like I said, experienced with you. And then the other thing that you do really well with that because uh, these centers of influences are are really great because they they know so many people that could that you could serve. And that's wonderful and all. But the other thing that you do really well is you follow up about it because it's it's one thing to just say, here's some contacts. Um, you also follow up with the center of influence, and 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 I've experienced that with you. That's how we've gotten to know each other better. Where you reached out to me and said, hey, you know, just catch up with you, but also, hey, what's going on with this one person that you referred to me? I I can't get a hold of them, or maybe what's the best way? And I think that that's really a smart thing to do because. Rather than bugging the other person, the, the prospect, let's call them, you're actually going back to the person that trusts you and that you trust and having mm -hmm. a conversation, a full rounded conversation about it and better understanding what's the best way for me to access this person again. What's a, what's mm -hmm. a better way? And, and to your point, um, people want to help people. And so I remember this conversation with you, and I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. And, yeah. you know, when you brought that up to me, I go, okay, well, you know what, this is going on in their business, this is going on in their life, and it might not be the right time to, to reach out to them, maybe wait a little while. And, you know, that's because I want to help you. Um, and, uh, you know, it kind of like comes full circle, which is really nice. So I, I really want to just add mm -hmm. that to what you just said there is that whole follow up piece is very important. What's interesting. Can I make a quick comment on that, actually? Yeah. I mean, within, so yeah, I, I sort of segment my 15 minute meetings. And, and what I usually do is I put a 15 minute buffer. So that if we go over the 15 minutes, no problem. But I at least want to sort of release them from my jail after 15 minutes if they've had enough. But usually what I do is, is I will speak, let them speak for the first 10 minutes. And 
Um, of the remaining five, I'll probably spend about four on myself if appropriate. And in the last minute, I always concretely ask is what are next steps? And I think a lot of times next steps are implied and it's really helpful to spell it out. Right. And, and I have weekly status updates meetings with my clients. Uh, we schedule half hour. We aim to be done in 10 because if we're communicating effectively throughout the week, we don't really need the time. But the last question there as well is what are next steps? Mm -hmm. Just make sure everyone understands who's responsible for what or what the expectation is, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's just really helpful to say, okay, um, you know, uh, I'm going to email you, Bob, and make that warm introduction. Or, you know, it sounds like now is not a good time. I will reach out to you in six months. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Done. Right? It's just, it's really um, very important, I think, to punctuate that end and make sure we're all on the same page. Mm. You know, when we're talking about this, these relationships, I, I'm kind of like reminded of the beginning of our conversation where you were talking about mentors and finding mentors and the importance of mentors and how you are a mentor and you also are a mentee in life. I'm interested in in where did you learn the importance of relationships? Um, again, because you say that you didn't receive really mentorship until later on in life, but for some reason, it sounds to me like you learned about relationships very early on. You know what? I'll, I'll sort of um, maybe reveal more than I normally would. I would argue that when I was younger, I was very much an angry person. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of anger. And my wife, God love her, is just one of these people who loves the world. And so through osmosis or whatever, I just gradually learned to love the world. Like she just genuinely loves everyone and not just like in a superficial way, like genuine way. And I kind of inherited that from her. Like I think through her, I gained an appreciation of just how fascinating and infinite people are. Right. Yeah. There's bad aspects of people, this and that, but I think the good outweighs the bad by far. And I think also it, it you have a choice of how you want to view someone. Right. I, I, I think, you know, if someone has 95 percent good qualities and 5 percent bad, it's really easy to see those 5 percent bad qualities and let it overshadow everything. Or you could say, OK, recognize your work in progress, their work in progress and sort of accept the good with the bad. And, and I'm not saying you leave yourself, you know, stupid and vulnerable and, and get walked all over. Obviously, you protect yourself, whatever that means, however you see fit. But I think it's really easy especially for insecure in ourselves to sort of put down the other person um and it's more advantageous if you have that strength to sort of see the positive and see the work in progress in the other person mm. yeah i i enjoy cultivating new relationships or forming new relationships and cultivating them i I think um, for me the line that i that i've heard and kind of try to live by is to see the best in others and yeah. to, um, you know, it's so easy to assume or, or take on something personally is what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, someone mm. gives you a, a dirty look or a rude comment or doesn't hold the door for you and you go, oh, that person is so rude or whatever. But if you see the best in everyone and you don't personalize things, you realize that wasn't even meant for you, that door slam or that that malintent or whatever. It wasn't even meant for you. And if you can look past that, like you just said, right? If you can look past yeah. that and extend your hand to shake that, their hand or or smile at them, you'll learn that they actually will smile back. They'll be like, oh, what, are you, you know, what are you so happy about? And and you might tell them and you might make their day. And, and it's really cool when that happens. Uh, for me, sometimes it happens at the supermarket, you know, with the cashier or with somebody yeah. in line. And I had these these two guys behind me actually just yesterday. I very rarely go in any longer because we uh, we just do the shop online thing and it just all comes yeah. out to the car, which is really cool. But yesterday I had to stop in just for a few little things. And uh, I had these guys behind me and um, two big burly guys, like just they they certainly did not look like you want to mess with them kind of guys. And, uh, and, and me, I, I, I'm not the kind to mess with anyone anymore in my life. So I don't want to mess with anybody either. But, 
you know, I, I had put stuff down and they had taken the, you know, that, that, that divider thing, which I always hate that divider thing, but I get it. And they took it and they put it like right, right at the cashier. And I, I, I had stepped away is what happened. I stepped away to just grab something off the side because, you know, they always have those little yeah. items to, to sell to you while you're there. And it was a honey mango. And I was like, oh, my daughter might really like that. So I, How do you say no to honey mango? I get it. I, I, I popped offline to go get it. And I saw them put the divider down. Now, I have the mindset of see the best in everyone. So when I walked back, I didn't even pay attention to the divider. And it, honestly, it didn't even, this wasn't even consciously happening. I just went along of just passing my produce onto the cashier. And let me tell you, these bo- both these guys kind of looked over and went, oh, I'm so sorry about that, sir. Nicest guys in the world. <laughs> Right. Move the divider back, and we start laughing. We started talking about something. We start laughing, and I, I think I mentioned something about the honey mango, and they started something, and and we're having this banter, and we're laughing and talking to each other, you know. But if I had, like what we just talked about, had looked at them, and be like, oh, look at them pushing the thing up front, trying to push me out of the way, we would have never had that fun little banter and like, hey, have a great day, you have a great day, kind of thing, you know. I, yeah. I would have just judged them based off of what they look like of like these, quite honestly, two big scary guys. <laughs> but meanwhile, they were the nicest guys in the world, you know. Yeah, totally. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. It's beautiful. And and you just don't know where those relationships go. It's it's interesting. That's it's also how we met, Jason. I don't remember. I don't know if you remember who introduced us. Howie. Yeah, yeah, we met. Howie Gershman. Met through a, a mentor. So I, I want to get back to the whole mentee and mentor thing in in your existence and in your life. What, what do you view as um, a mentor? What is your definition of, of those terms? That's really interesting. I've never thought to define it. I, I think, first of all, it's someone who's willing to be open and to share. Um, I th- I'm probably going to butcher the quote. Um, Mark Twain, I think, said, um, experience is a very good but very inefficient teacher. Mm. In, in other words, you know, you learn from experience, but it's a lot more efficient if someone just tells you not to do something or to do something rather than you have to jump off that cliff yourself. Mm. It's better to have someone say, yeah, I spent a month in a hospital. You don't want to do that. Right. And, and so I think a mentor is someone who's willing to take his or her experiences and share. Um, but also, I think, um, you know, I think the best leaders are those who make other leaders. And so a good mentor isn't trying to make you in his or her mold. A, a, a mentor, I think, is someone who recognizes everyone has their path in life and we just happen to cross paths. And I'm here to help you along yours. Mm. Right. I think also um, I'm going to define this a little differently, but I'm going to use the term humility. And when I say humility, I mean, you don't have to make a lot of noise to state who you are, but you know who you are. Mm. Right. There's a certain sense of it's not arrogance at all. You just don't need to be flashy, but you matter of factly know you excel in this area, you excel in that area, you're weak in that area, and you have no qualms about it. Mm. Yeah, the the mentor-mentee relationship is, I think, so important uh, as we, I think anywhere in life, not just as entrepreneurs or business leaders or community leaders, I think it's, like you just said there, you know, you're, you're taking from somebody else's experience and you're applying it to your life and you're applying it so that I don't think it's so you don't make the same mistakes, but I think it's so that maybe if you do, at least you're a little more educated on that mistake, and maybe maybe you you pull back a little bit faster than than you may have normal. And I, um, you know, for me, I, I I had somebody share with me like, hey, don't don't do those that kind of advertisement and insurance doesn't work. And I was like, well, what do you know? Well, it wasn't working, and if it wasn't for those two cents that that person added from to me, which they weren't a mentor to me, they were just somebody just sharing their information with me, which is still very similar. I think a mentor is somebody who you have a longer standing relationship with and have built trust with and and meet with over time regularly. So I wouldn't call this this person who said that to me as a mentor. But what I would say is that while I didn't listen to him, it did stick with me to not double down on when I saw failure in what I was doing. And I was like, you know what? Maybe he was right. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I hear that. Who who had who has been some of your mentors in your life? Wherever you have ex- have experienced that. It's interesting. I'll, I'll name people. Um, probably one of my first breaks with a guy named Frank McEwen. Mm. And Frank was a very sharp businessman, and I've told this to his face, so I don't mind telling everyone. The thing I used to love about him is there'd be a boardroom, and there'd be like a side counter where they had like coffee and stuff like that. And he would never sit at the board table. He'd hop up on that counter and let his legs swing up and down, sort of like an eight-year-old kid. And he was probably in his 40s or 50s at the time. And what I realized is he had this childlike fascination with everything. Um, and I remember he would, you know, back in the nineties and whatnot, he would sell businesses left, right and center. And one year he decided he sold his business and he, to describe what he did, he stayed home for a year and made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for his kids as they went to school. He stayed home and was Mr. Mom and was very happy, but he was also just very in touch with himself and it really resonated with me. Um, Sean Callagy is another of Unblinded is another mentor of mine. Sean's a great guy. I, I've learned a lot through him. Uh, more recently, I've met someone named uh, Jason Jimenez, who's uh, based out of Houston, also does insurance, and is doing something called Landing Blue Whales. Sorry, Landing Big Whales. Pardon me for that. And um, has really spoken to me as well. Um, um, I would also say like. Um, to get more personal, so to speak, um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs is someone who um, passed away recently, but straddled many worlds and was ha- able to have many conversations. Um, and the last one I'll share, I'm probably butchering his name, even though he is a um, very special place in my heart, is a guy named, I believe, Chris Nykik, if I'm not mispronouncing it. And he is the first person with Down syndrome to have completed the Iron Man. Wow. And the reason why he was spoke to me so much was because of his father. Um, when he decided he was going to do the Ironman, apparently he could do a lap and a half in the pool at most. And his father said to him, what can we do 1% better this week than we did last week? Hmm. And so obviously, if you take that attitude in 100 weeks, you're going to be 100% better than you were, if not more. Wow. So that's really the message is not just that perseverance to have completed the Iron Man, which I, you know, maybe one day, maybe in seven lifetimes, I'll do it. But that attitude of what can I, whether it's, you know, as an entrepreneur or a business owner, a father, a husband, whatever, what can I do 1% better this week than I did last week? Yeah, those small increments are really yeah. what move things. It's it's all about the, those small increments. Um, I, I think some some fascinating mentors uh, that you've listed there, and I love all the different qualities that you enjoy in them. It sounds like you you enjoy childlike behaviors and all of you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your friend Sean because Unblinded is part of how we met. It was uh, how he was yeah. part of Unblinded. He met you, and we were at a at an event together. I think you were a judge, and um, and that's how our relationship started. Um, so I'm interested in this Unblinded and the impact that it has as well, because it, it's, it, very, it is a very impactful organization. And uh, I'd like mm. if you could share a little bit more about it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, I guess I'll give a bit of an overview and then sort of talk about how it impacted me. Um, Sean, just to give you a bit of background for those who don't know him and why it's called Unblinded, uh, Sean many moons ago was a very promising young baseball player um, and played at the collegiate level and unfortunately has a genetic condition, which is making him blind. Hmm. So um, I don't, I think he saw the writing on the wall and and actually ended up going to law school, became a lawyer. Um, And he did this crazy thing where he went to work for a law firm, hated it, took out about a hundred thousand dollars in credit card debt in his early twenties and opened his own law firm. Um, and everyone around him told me he was insane. Uh, I'm doing a bad job telling the story, but suffice it to say that he basically was able to sell it um, and then went back again and started his own law firm. And he realized he had certain, um, for lack of a better word, techniques or knowledge that he was able to use in order to gain success in his life. 
um, just one little story about him. I'm probably, again, going to butcher it. So, Sean, if you're listening, apologies. He's very involved in the uh, Tony Robbins world. Mm. And he was asked by Tony to speak on the stage to sort of promote the uh, Platinum and Lion packages that they have available. And if I'm not mistaken, those are about $100,000 per year. Mm -hmm. And Sean got up on stage and spoke and did an okay job. And then Tony asked him again, and he said, if you don't mind, I'd like to do it my way, if you don't mind. And Tony says, okay. So Sean got up on stage, and not only did he sell the most packages ever in the history of Tony Robbins, but he sold it by a factor of four. So the the, the second place was only 25% of what he was able to sell. And basically what Sean does is he has three areas of focus, one of which is process mastery, which is how do you get done what you need to get done a day in the most efficient way possible. Everyone always says this all the time. There's only 24 hours in a day. Everyone has the same you know, um, time slots, but some people are more successful and more efficient than others. Um, Self-mastery, which is sort of working on yourself and making sure you're in optimal performance. And the third one, which is sort of what we focus on more when we do those unblinded events, is influence mastery. And the assertion is that every conversation is a form of influence. And whether it's you talk to your spouse, your child, a colleague, a prospect, you're trying to influence them to say yes to something. So it's really about being integrous, but also finding the most efficient way possible to get someone from hello to yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, I'm really indebted to Sean because um, I used to sort of, I'll be honest, I used to say to myself half jokingly that if I'd hired myself as a salesperson, I'd fire myself. Um, but I've gained a few superpowers with him. And I feel um, when I was in Unblinded, I, they used to jokingly call it the dojo where we used to have practices all the time. And I guess if I can flatter myself and like myself to a martial artist who has a black belt, I was scared in the dojo, but now I'm pretty fearless in, in the real world. Like I could talk to everyone about everything and anything. And I, you know, I'm very grateful for Sean and the unblinded team for giving me those skills that I've been able to employ since then. Yeah. And, and what is your personal experience there? Is that, is it at the dojo? Is that what you were saying, referring to? Yeah, I mean, they would have um, morning huddles where people would role play and get together. And, and so if, if you're, you know, if you're a martial artist and you're doing with other martial artists, you know, you can get a few bruises. But if you're just walking down the street and someone tries to pick a fight, you know, good chance that they're going to, one's going to end up on the ground and not you, mm. right? So, uh, and, and, and I make that sound like it's it's a rough and tumble. It's I just mean... Um, it's a real good learning experience. It's a very loving environment. Um, and I guess that's one thing I look for in ecosystems is that people that are driven, but are kind. Mm. And a lot of times, unfortunately, what happens is you have these idyllic ecosystems and then you have people who have agendas that take it over. And I've been very blessed that I've been around a number of ecosystems where that never happens. Yeah, that, that kindness is so important. I think I, I feel the same way because that kindness is also like genuineness in that it's you're not just sharing, you know, when you talk about self mastery. I mean, self mastery is, uh, I think, having a lot of gratitude, it's a lot of appreciation. Mm -hmm. And while you could be a really good presenter and a really good public speaker and share all of that, if you're not exemplifying it through your actions and through the way that you hold a group or hold people accountable, then it kind of falls flat. You know, you can talk about gratitude all day long, but if you're not showing that you're gracious and if you're not being gracious with your, with your community, then, then it disappears. And so I, I love that you share that, that he, you know, he and, and everybody in that community is very kind and shows that kind of kindness, which is really, really important when we go back to relationships is, you know, think about the best relationships we have. They're the ones who are complimentary, who are grateful for the relationship, are the ones who appreciate the time that we spend together or, or the things that we do. And, you know, it speaks a lot to it. Um, yeah, I want to I, I want to just go into the process mastery in Unblinded. And the reason why I want to bring up process ma mastery is that's something that your business focuses on is processes. 
So I'm interested in in how that has maybe helped the business or how you may have been able mm-hmm. to bring value to Unblinded through your experience as um, a company that actually does that for, for others. That's an interesting question. It's a really interesting question. I mean, I haven't been in Unblinded for about a year. Um, but I, I one thing I did pick up from Sean that I found very helpful is to sort of bookend my week, is to sort of use my Monday to plan out my week and sort of establish what I'm going to do every day and then use my Friday to understand what did I do this week and what am I, how is that going to leapfrog into the next week, the Monday? So that's one thing that's been very effective. Um, but I, I would argue that, you know, our, what we're doing is a little different because arguably what Sean is doing is, is looking for process mastery on the individual level. Like how can I be more effective? Right. And really what we're doing funny enough is the way I describe us to our clients in the world is that we don't have any expertise whatsoever. What we do have though, is the ability to take your expertise and repurpose it in such a way that other people can use and apply it. Mm. Right. And, and so, you know, just to go on that tangent for a second, um, when we're talking to someone about their sales process, we're going to sort of take it out of them and make it galvanize it and make it more digestible and actionable than if they were to do it themselves or just speak to it. Right. Having said that, if I'm dealing with a company that um, has subpar areas that we feel that is not within our abilities, it gets back to how can we have service to you? So a classic example is dealing with a startup. They've grown, they've grown, they've grown. And the bookkeeper has evolved to become the CFO. Mm. And this CFO does not have CFO training. So they're suffering because they don't have that strength in that area. We would strongly advocate for bringing a fractional CFO on board or a fractional COO or a fractional CMO, whatever that is. Um, I'm again, it's about being of service and, and having relationship, but really for us process is sort of really about understanding what is the expertise? What are you trying to accomplish? How do we reverse engineer from your outcome to your input and how do we optimize it so that other people can use and apply it? Hmm. Where have you seen the greatest success in that? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, I One story I like to tell, and, and I won't say who it is for now, but I was doing sales process with this person. And this, and the person said, I, I extracted the information from the salesperson. And he said, I can't wait to use and apply this. And I said to this person, what do you mean use and apply it? It came from your head. And he said, yeah, but you made it, solidified it in such a way that I can use it better than it was in my head. It was in my subconscious, but now I can actually apply what you're saying. Hmm. I feel like that sounds very familiar. <laughs> yeah, I think it does sound familiar. <laughs> that, that was uh, our work together. Yeah, I, I do. I, I actually, I remember exactly where I was standing actually when I said all that because we did, we went through the sales process and it's, it's very funny, like, and I'm, and I'm happy that you brought that up because it speaks to the work that you do, is that there's so much in our head and that we don't even know is there, um, yeah. if that comes out right, in that, you know, if you asked me when I first started my company, Michael, what's your sales process, which you did, by the way, I'd say, I don't know. I, I don't know what my sales process is. I don't have a sales process. But by, by the questions that you asked and, and allowing the space for me to share you know what a client interaction looks like what i what i perceive it to look like after they they sign on and everything then i started downloading to you what was going on in my mind and it was all there the the process was there it just was stuck in my head and the other story that i was hoping that you might bring up or that i hope that you will bring up after this is one that i remember you telling me when we were going through that process together of you were working with a, a company and there was something about a Porsche. I don't, I don't know if you know which story I'm talking about. You might use that as a very often exa- an example about taking the company where they, they said, you know what, you, you've, 
made it like a Porsche for me where it moves fast or something like that. I don't know if you remember the story. I'm, I'm waiting for your facial reaction, quite honestly, right now. I'm buying myself time, so just interrupt if you do. But I, I'll, I'll keep going here. And you were working with them. I think that they had like put the project on pause and they kind of like got caught up in, in other things and realized that it was taking them longer to do things. I think maybe it had to do with it was taking them longer to do things and they kind of called you back up and they, they said, you know, I need you to to run my business like a Porsche or something like that. I remember a Porsche being involved. Okay. That doesn't resonate. I mean, like, so just to sort of like, if I go back a few years ago, for example, I used to work with a lot of fortune 500 companies. Um, and one of the things I did for them is I worked with the arguably the largest investment house in Canada where I'm based and we overhauled the training program for their investment advisors um, to the point where they said, as far as we're concerned, this is one of the best programs in its time in, in North America. They were just ecstatic, right? Um, I've, I've done all kinds of things. Really, what I'm just trying to do is move the needle for my client. Mm. Yeah, that's um, and, and that's what you do. I mean, that's that's really it. Like when you're when you start putting the processes down then the client can actually see what they are. Um, I, I wish I could remember this story for you because it, it was really, it's, it's kind of like the beginning of our relationship, uh, the client, client um, relationship where I was your client. Um, it, it's just really solidified what you do and how important processes are and that this person, from what I remember of the story was, they were pretty much stuck in the day-to-day -day stuff. And that by downloading their processes, uh, eventually finally like understanding what you did and downloading their processes, they were able to pass that stuff on. Yeah. So I can talk about that at a high level and I'll, I'll try and think of some concrete examples that, that will support what I'm saying is, is when you look at the business owners, the challenge is, is that the information's in their head, right? And, and what I'm constantly asking people that I deal with is, um, what could you do versus what should you do? Mm. And, and really what I am helping companies do is take all the information that is in people's heads and institutionalize it. So it happens on a few levels. So um, I was, I'll give you a, a bit of a horror story that I was dealing with. Um, and I definitely will not say who the client was, uh, but a multinational food company, I was dealing with the Canadian arm of it and basically one of the techies there had built a what i'll call a black box which is extracting information from their systems and outputting it as excel files to different departments anything that was dynamic that people relied on such as you know logistics pricing anything marketing and intel stuff like that he was sending them and they realized he was retiring in a few months and if this thing went down no one would be able to fix it and no one would be able to get their info so this could kind of bring the company to its knees, right? And that's no different than for argument's sake, you having a right-hand man or woman and they suddenly leave and all of a sudden all that information's gone. And or uh, quite frankly, business owners, and I am guilty of this as, as, the, as far as the next person goes, business owners getting in their own way because they are the company and they're not allowing the company to grow and expand and scale and or if appropriate exit. So, so really what I'm doing, I'm doing a few things. I'm arguably applying a franchise model to a small business. Because when you buy a Starbucks or McDonald's or I don't care what, it's not so much of a restaurant as as much of a system. Because it doesn't just teach you how to make burgers or coffee. It teaches you how to clean toilets, how to service customers, how to market, how to everything. And businesses are well served by having that same sort of systems in place. And the truth is, in most cases, they have those systems, they just exist in their head. And it's kind of lopsided in the sense that a lot of it is rests on ownership and management. And there's no reason why we can't right side it and have that information sharing going to the employees. So employees can grow within the company. There's expectations, there's competencies, and everything's right sided. People are in the right seat doing the right job. Mm. And that's really what I'm helping companies do. Mm. What's what's one way that a company, a small business or entrepreneur can start doing? What's something they can start doing today to start uh, that process that you're speaking oh, to? I, I mean, 
Yeah. I mean, one thing I would suggest, especially on management level, is just to keep a little diary mm. and just look at every task you do and ask yourself, is this something I should be doing or could be doing? Is this something, whenever I have a task, I always like to see, can I automate this or delegate this? Right. Right. So like, for example, if I have to send a bunch of emails, should I invest in email sequencing software? If it's just, you know, copy paste or is it something that needs to be personalized? Is it something that someone can send on my behalf? Or is it something that, no, this is a very important relationship to me and I need to invest in that relationship. Mm. Yeah. Right. And so just go through and, and look at and ask yourself, what could I doing versus what should I do be doing? And um, be honest with yourself and ask yourself, what significance do I get from doing this? Right. Right. And to what extent is it very important to you? And what, to what extent is it just ego? Mm. Ego, meaning that you're hanging on to this. um this this job this uh this task uh because you don't want to release it to somebody else it, it, it you don't want to release it and and, and and i'm going to say something that people might vociferously disagree with is you'll say but i'm the only one who could do it this well mm. and that's fine but the question is let's say you know i i do 100 percent. someone else will do 80 percent. well in some cases maybe 80 percent is good enough or maybe some cases you can mentor this person to get to 100% and then you don't need to do it anymore. Right. Right. But, but in every case, um, there are things that we are doing that we really have no business doing. But just by road, by habit, we just keep doing it. Right. Um, I, I would also, um, the other thing I would say is, is too many times there's really great ideas that come from lower down. And just because of hierarchical setups, they're not open to feedback from employees. I think there's a lot of intel that isn't necessarily at the strategic, but more the tactical level. And if there was methodologies to get that information and feedback from people, I think it would serve the company well. Mm. You know, a, a concrete example of that also I find is, is to my mind, um, sales and marketing should be in a symbiotic relationship, right? Marketing is there to support sales. Sales is getting all kinds of intel they can give back to marketing of how to optimize marketing. But often they don't communicate and they, you know, operate in the dark from each other, which is really unfortunate. And that's just, just by simply communicating and, and sort of having a common goal, a common vision, a common understanding and just communicating effectively, um, you can save each other and not just a lot of heartache, but be, you know, more optimal in what you're trying to accomplish. Mm. Yeah. The, I, I, I think the documenting of processes and all of that is, is very, very beneficial to any business out there. And I, I, I like that you also kind of like make it very simple and in, in bringing it down to just a journal. Um, because I think that could also make your job a lot easier if somebody comes to you with their journal and say, Hey, I got this little journal here that I've been doing for the last three years. Can you can you get this down for us and create some kind of infrastructure? I think it helps. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Like when I talk to people, um, a lot of times they'll say, "I don't need you. I just need someone to clone three of me." And, and my response to that is, "Okay, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. But what if we could, you know, take." 30% off your plate per person that we bring on board who takes things on and is trained to do it. Mm. Would that be worth your while? You, you see, so like I have sort of two parts of my brain. One of them is training and knowledge management and thinking about pedagogy and, and knowledge transfer. But at the end of the day, I'm also a business owner. And so the, the three letters I care the most about are ROI. Mm. Right. How, how are we going to leverage whatever we're doing to drive ROI? It's got to be more sales, gained efficiency, more time, something. It's not just a nice to have. Right. Yeah. It has to have some kind of return on investment. It's funny. We were, you, you and I spoke about that just the other day about my program that I'm doing and trying to figure out what's the ROI. The other thing that you do very yeah. good with ROI is that you were saying it, it's something that, 
it's not just about the big ROI of, you know, this cost X and you're going to get this, this in return, but it's that constant check-in that you brought up to me of, of constantly checking in with the client and with others of, does this make sense? Is this, is this still, is this still giving you the return that you were looking for? I thought that was very smart as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's an ongoing conversation, right? Um, Absolutely. Well, to switch gears a little bit here and to try to get a little bit uh, uh, insight in what's going on in the processes in your mind, um, one of the things that that I I noticed that you wrote down was about uh, if you could speak to yourself 10 years from now um, and what you would remind yourself. And I'm I'm interested in bringing this up because I, I want to bring this up before we we wrap up the show because I I think it's so nice when I and refreshing when I see what you wrote and I'd, I'd be happy to share it for you if if you'd like but I, I'd, I'd rather you share it oh do you want do you want me to read uh, it? I mean I think I remember what I said yeah I'd, I'd yeah. prefer that yeah what's so, the destination yeah I I think it's so important to hear that because you know in this conversation we're speaking about relationships we're speaking about. Uh, we're, we're speaking about processes and all this other stuff, but at the end of the day, I think you encapsulate it really nice with looking at your life 10 years from now of, of what it really is. And, and I'd love for you to share that with our audience. Yeah. If I remember what I said, um, I was basically saying, I think it's important to have your eye on the destination, but to look out the window once in a while and, and admire the scenery. Mm, yeah. You know, I, I think it's really important. You know, we, we are driven to do certain things that um you know oh, i'm gonna make a slightly strong statement but i think one of the secrets of success i've seen with successful people is the ability to d- delay gratification you know those who want an instant payoff on something and want it now and then consume it and it's gone that's very temporary but people who are willing to whether it's invest in education or invest in a business or invest in something they understand that's a long game, right? And and the payoff is not in the in the immediate; it's down the road. But I think you have to balance that out. Is is you have to sort of have your eye on that ball, and understand what I'm doing it for myself, I'm doing it for my kids, doing it for my wife. But if you don't spend the time with your wife, your kids, yourself, then what's the point of it? Mm. You know what what's I hate to say it, but what's the point if you work really hard for all that and you're divorced and your kids don't talk to you, but now you have $10 million. Right. Right. You, you lost, you sort of kept your eye on the ball and you hit the destination, but you didn't check out the scenery on the way. Mm. And, and I think it's, you know, I think I, I'm a beginner at this and it's becoming very trendy, but mindfulness, I think mindfulness is really important whether you, you know, are consciously doing it or not. I think you have to be just mindful of what you have presently as well as what you want in the future. You have to have that balance. I I really liked the analogy of seeing the scenery along the way because I feel like it's it's painting a picture, you know, uh, mm. to, to bring you to your sales training days. <laughs> Paint a picture for the customer. And when I think about that, I, I see it, and, and it goes into everything that we just spoke about of, how do you form a relationship? Well, you don't just shoot for the relationship. You don't just shoot for the, let's become best friends and let me go through your contact list. I, I think it's about enjoying the scenery together in terms of that, of, of let's get to know each other and, and you know, let's create value for each other as we go along. And, and it's not necessarily just about what context you have for me or can you buy my product, but it's about that journey together. And it's the same with business and, and entrepreneurship and the processes. It's like not just figure out the process so that I can sell more product or I can duplicate or clone myself. Yeah. It's let's go enjoy the scenery. What what in that process do you like? What in that process helps gets us to the final point? And so I, when you when you wrote that in there, I thought, wow, you know, it really I was really able to see it and enjoy the scenery along the way. And I think that that also relieves so much stress and anxiety that so much of us experience in terms of like the pressure of time is that when we mm-hmm. look at it and we go, all right, there's this destination, there's this end point somewhere. We don't, we, we could put dates on it. We could put times on it and everything. But if we're enjoying the scenery and it's so funny because it reminds me of car rides with the kids and you know this, it's like, you know, if the kid is, is sitting back there for, you know, it's a two, three hour long car ride. And the kid's sitting back there and is going, 
are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Well, the, the ride feels like it's forever. But when you tell the kids, hey, you know what? Why don't you just look out the window? Why don't you count how many blue cars are passing? Why don't you, like, you know, tell us about the trees. Tell us about the scenery that you see. Tell us what, what's going on out there. They're like, whoa, this was the fastest trip in the world. It was the same amount of time as last time. It's just that you started enjoying the scenery along the way, right? Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, I you said that. it. You said it, not me. I just, I just, uh, <laughs> I just embraced it because I, it really spoke to me when I saw when I read that. Thank you. Um, I always like to try to get into, uh, w- you know, different m- mantras or quotes as we conclude, and how you could expand on them for us. And you put two in here, but what was interesting about your two is typically when I ask for mantras or quotes, they come in with quotation marks around it. Yours came with questions. And I thought that was interesting because I guess as a process guy, you do ask yourself a lot of questions as you go along. So I'll share with everybody your questions and I'm interested if you could expand on these and how they they help inspire you in your day to day, which are, how can I be of service? And number you wrote number one, how can I be of service? And number two, is the honeymoon over? Yeah, so I, I guess I'm sort of sharing a little secret on the second one. But the first one, like I said, it, it's how can you do a service? We talked about that. And, and it's, it's not how can I sell you? How can I do this? How can I do that? How can you be a service? And it just changes the conversation entirely. Um, when people realize I'm being genuine, because I think the, at first when you sort of ask that question, people sort of like, okay, that's really you asking for how you can sell me. No. I'm asking how I can be service, right? And it just changes the conversation. And, and I think also I have a, a plentitude mentality. If I had a scarcity mentality, I wouldn't be able to ask that question, right? Because I'm a man of faith. I'm convinced that what I need is out there. And it may be here, it may not. But I'll just find out how I can be of service to you along the way. Again, I'm, you know, you're the scenery, I guess, as I'm talking to as I'm in that destination. And I can sort of say, yeah, yeah, whatever. You, I, I can't sell to you, so we get out of here. Or no, this is a beautiful person. Let's sit and talk to them. And I've had some pretty amazing conversations that you know has resulted in life-changing insights or business that j- was generated directly or indirectly and whatnot. With regard to the second one, um, we this this is an internal match we have with dealing with our clients. Is the honeymoon over? We never want our clients to sort of feel like um, okay, we're sort of bored and tired and we were romancing at first, but now we're just hanging around our underwear watching reruns on TV, drinking beer, right? Um, and, and I think that's, uh, speaking as a man, that's that's the temptation. Is once you're married, you can quote unquote get comfortable and stop dating your wife and stop being interested in your wife and stuff like that. And it's really important to sort of still, you know, seduce your wife, so to speak, on a constant basis. I don't mean necessarily sexually. I just mean, you know, engage with her and i think it's important with the client if if we feel they're not getting warm fuzzies we want to know and that's part of what those status update meetings are for is if we sense it's not a warm fuzzy going on we want to hit that pause that pause button and say okay hey what's going on like like is everything cool is there anything we can do is there any issues we should be aware of and put that out in the open as opposed to just sort of sweeping under the carpet or whatever i i find between those two things, when un- people understand you're there to be of service to them and you really want them to have those warm fuzzies and you'll do things within reason to help, they're very open and very respectful. Yeah, and I and I think it's becoming more common to hear salespeople or uh, business owners or entrepreneurs or anybody out there who's selling something uh, to bring up uh, service or to serve. Um, but it's not always the case. And so it, it's a, qua- and, and also like you just said, is the, the, I think the, the trueness behind it, right? That, that the authenticity behind it of, you really do want to serve the other person. And I think that also comes from, you know, you, you mentioned your, your complimentary consultation, which I encourage anybody to take up right now. Again, another thing people say, oh, free this, free that. Yeah, we get it. But it's about what value are you getting out of that free, that complimentary um, meeting? What value are you getting out of that salesperson who says, how can I serve you? And you'll know very quickly 
if they're just saying it because they heard it as like a really good catchphrase because they mm. they won't have anything of value to offer you. They, they'll just be taking, they'll say, how can I serve you? But they'll just be taking versus like my meetings with you and, and um, what we do at Denton and, and, and a lot of people in your network and in my network, like Howie and so many others who truly mean, you know, how can I serve you and, and present yeah. value up front and say, how can I serve you? Here's who I know. Here are some people I think could help you. Here's some information I can share with you. And that's true service because then the other person, you don't, you don't, you almost never, you don't even have to say, how can I serve you? Because as soon as you meet them, you're telling them, hey, you know, I, I came across this one profile and I saw you, you sell insurance and I thought they might be a good fit for you. Or I came across this mm-hmm. other profile and I know you do processes and I thought you, you might be a good fit. Boom, service. You know, so I, I encourage everybody out there that if you're going to use that line of how can I serve you is make sure that you have something of value to share with them right away from the onset. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I, I think it's to, just to riff off of that for a second. I, I think, you know, if you if you look at your offering, um, you know, obviously it's something you you take great pride in and you're there to serve the world again. Again, that's that term serve. And therefore, you're being of service by offering it. But conversely, if you realize that in this particular case, you're not being of service to the person by offering it, there are other ways to be of service. Mm. Right? It, it's it's just it's just obvious to me, you know, it, it's, it's either or, or both, you know, are the, are the, what you have is, is going to serve them and not serve your bank account, but serve them. And here's why. And that becomes the basis of the relationship mm-hmm. and, or based on what they said, here's how you can help people. And guess what? I mean, if you help two people, I mean, if you want, if you want to look at it from a non altruistic perspective, there's two people who are now indebted to you. And you've strengthened that relationship. And even if you're looking at it from a strict business building perspective, you now have two people who really are indebted to you and somehow want to help you and serve you. Mm, yeah. And I think it's a really great way for, for several things here. And, and I kind of want to stay here for a second because I think this mm. is really important because I learned this from, from other mentors in that one – it's a really great way for if the service isn't right for you. I think people have a hard time saying no, especially when they like somebody like like you or you know have a, have a charismatic personality. They have a hard time saying no, so they might they might start ghosting them. They might start blowing them off. They might start um, uh, being a little abrupt. When meanwhile they would like to have a relationship with that salesperson, they just don't know how to say no to them. And I think that with what mm. we're talking about about service, and there's other ways than just buying the product as well is, hey, you know what, I, you know, I, I think your processes, I think your, your business is, is really great and I like you and I like the relationship. You know, this isn't right for me, but here's two people that it might be right for. Why don't you give them a call? And then boom, right. immediately the attention has shifted from you as the focus to sell to, to these other two people. But you're doing it in an off, like again, in a way where it's true, you're like you're not just passing it, handing them off. You're saying these two people could probably, you know, get some some value out of your service, which I think is important. And the other one that, that was taught to me with what you were just saying is I had a panel that we had put together and one of the panelists dropped off. And, but what, what I learned from him was he dropped off and he, and he, he texted me and he said, Hey, listen, I hate to do this to you, but I, I'm not going to be able to make it. I have a conflict that day that just came up and I got to do it. And mm-hmm. he's a government official. So it was like, I get it. Right. Um, Literally, the government would come for him. Ha, ha, ha. So anyway, but what he did was he offered me somebody else of value. And he said, you know, this other person um, Mm. is going to be a tremendous value to your panel and um, reach out to him. Let him know that I that I introduced you, whatever. I'll, I'll give him a heads up. And, and I did, and, and I ended up forming a relationship with that person, and it was really, really valuable to that relationship and that panelist, but more so it taught me that if you're not able to do something, if, if you're being asked to do something, sometimes it's hard to say no, refer somebody. You know, you can offer value just by sharing your network, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and just, I know we're going a different direction when I say this, but I think it's important too, um, for your own sake, make it easy for people to say no. Yeah. Right. And 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 that adds value in and of itself. 
it's it's funny that you bring that up because it's part of your sales process. I noticed uh, your check in, and um, and I noticed that, and and it gets me every time whenever somebody does it to me. Um, your check in is like, and this might not be right for you, <laughs> and I'm like, it it sure is right for me, darn it. <laughs> But yeah, it's funny. I, I don't realize I say that. Uh, okay, I, I, I don't. Yeah, yeah. You, you might have just been. It's probably part of this um, philosophy that you have of make it easy for them to say no. Is you know, like, is everything I'm saying does it make sense for you? It might not be right for you, or something like along those lines. Well, you know, so people who are new to sales think that when someone says, "Okay, send me a proposal," it's a yes. Right. It's a polite no. It, it's, I don't feel comfortable saying no. I'll pretend I read something. You're going to spend 20 hours putting something together I'm never going to look at. And so I'd rather just, you know, have a solid no. I even, I'll share this with you, and it, it's worked, is um, we, we're all received it and been guilty of it is what I call radio silent. You mm-hmm. have a really good conversation. They say, okay, it's just bad timing. Follow up with me in two months. And you follow up in two months. And, of course, they don't say anything. And you follow up two weeks later and just say, just checking in. I've actually done this before where I make like make makeshift check boxes with the bracket signs. And I say, Hey Mike, haven't heard Michael, haven't heard from you for a while. Which one is it? Um, thanks, just not interested, really interested, just bad time, whatever. And I just sort of let them check the box. But the point is I'm giving them an out, right? Mm. And it's sort of like a last ditch effort just to see what's going on. And it's not rude for my part, and I don't mind what they say. And it's funny, it works most times is they'll just get back they'll check one of the boxes say really really sorry um either you know not interested anymore or really am interested but still crazy let's circle back in two months so sorry i haven't heard from you but at least i can answer which is all i want i i love that one i'm gonna have to borrow that one that one's really cool i mean i feel like it's just really cool because how many people are doing that right (laughs) yeah i don't know not not too many. I think that's pretty neat. I, I wouldn't do that as a second email, but it's like if we're talking like the eighth, ninth, when we had, like I said, we've actually had a really good conversation and then you're ghosting me. I want to know what's going on, right? It's funny. I was going right in with the second email. <laughs> 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 Why are you ghosting me? Oh, man. Well, this this has been really wonderful. I'm I'm really happy that um, we were able to connect on this and that we were able to make this work. Uh, like I said, it, it's always cool to have a guest join the show from another country, uh, but it's also always cool to have a guest join that I've gotten to know over time and have built a relationship with and mm. um, and really value you know your expertise and your knowledge. And um, I also value the time that, that we've spent together where it wasn't necessarily about my business or your business, but it was just kind of getting to know each other. And so I I think that you are a master in relationship building and uh, are also a master in helping people, um, you know, really understand your value and helping them understand their value, um, which plays into the whole relationship thing. So I'm very grateful for having you on the show today. I'm very grateful for for meeting you so long ago. And we got to give a big shout out to Howie for introducing us. And, and everything else. Is there anything new happening in, in your world that you'd like to share with anybody? I think one thing I want to share before I say what's new happening in my world is um, I realize just something as we're talking, Michael, is is in many respects, you're my mentor. Because when I look at your definition of service, your heart is so big, you're looking to impact not necessarily just your community, which you are, but the world. Like you're very philanthropically involved to make positive change in the world in a concrete, not just one day, but now kind of way. And and you do it through action. You do it through thought and love. And I just really want to commend you for doing what you do. Thank you. I, I think it's really important. I appreciate that. It's, uh, uh, I know a lot of people talk about it, but it's, it's, um, it's it's a it's a challenging thing, uh, but you know it's as long as we keep moving forward and we keep trying and trying and trying and trying and and helping as many people as we can, you know, eventually, you know, it's it's kind of like that trickle effect of like if I can help one person, that person can help two people, and those two people can help two people themselves. You know, it's it's really what it's all about. But I I appreciate you you witnessing that and being a part of it as well. By the way, so thank you very much. Um, 
So what is new with you? Are you doing any more of those uh, at your service events? At your service is on hold for now. Okay. Um, I'm just focusing internally. We're, we're, you know, really excited. We're uh, one thing I love is, is I'm a wannabe geek. And as a wannabe geek, I'm learning something new every day and I'm industry agnostic. So, you know, like our clients are all over the map and it's just so much fun to be delving in different things. Like right now we're dealing with a nonprofit that deals, helps African nations. We're dealing with an m a firm um, we're doing with a art school slash preschool slash petting zoo um and you know others people in the wings as well it's just fun um i just love learning something new every day and being able to share knowledge and best practices that we have to help people grow so i, I kind of feel like you know not only am i just extracting information repurposing it but i'm also feel like to some ways i'm, I'm humbled to be a conduit where I'm sort of sharing information to absorb from other places and then giving back to other clients still. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, and blessed up place to be in. Yeah, that's cool. It's, it's, uh, it's really cool when you get to learn about all different industries and businesses. When you brought up the zoo, I'm kind of like laughing here because um, on, on my Instagram lives, there is a woman who joins almost all the time from Australia. Her name's Holly. She's, she's terrific. She's so cool. She's part of that community. And, uh, and my daughters like to come on the live and say hi. And Holly and my daughters have formed this like relationship through the lens kind of thing. Uh, cause we don't even see Holly. We just, we just see her comments. She just will comment things of like, hi, beautiful girls or something like that, which is really, really nice. Mm-hmm. And so my daughter, my daughter, uh, made a koala. Uh, art piece at school and in kindergarten and was writing different facts about koalas and in it it's like koalas uh, you know climb trees koala eat leaves and it says koalas live in the zoo and holly's on the other end she's in australia she's like no koalas don't live in the zoo here they live in the wild it's it was pretty neat it was funny <laughs> that's great it's funny what, what do we what we view as zoo animals right exactly um, Jason, how can people, th- this will of course all be in the show notes, but how can people get a hold of you? How can they connect with you on LinkedIn? Uh, how can they find you to, to learn more about your services and, and form a relationship with you? Sure. Um, so they could reach me at Jason at clickknowledge.com. It's click in knowledge, one word, one K. Um, my last name, um, actually I'll just spell out the company so you can search for me on LinkedIn as well. C L I C K N O W L E D G E. Mm -hmm. Um, you can also reach me on LinkedIn and, um, I don't have URLs handy, which I should have, but maybe I could send them to you that you can post after. Yes. They'll be in the show notes. They'll be in the show notes. So I'll leave uh, links as far as people can book complimentary consults with me or just reach out for a 15 minute chat if they want. Yep. And that's Jason Helfenbaum, H E L F E N B A U M. And you could certainly find him on LinkedIn and comes right up. You got like 6,000 connections on there. It's pretty cool. Cool. Well, this, is, like this has been an awesome show. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to The Michael Esposito Show. For show notes, video clips, and more episodes, go to michaelespositoinc.com backslash podcast. Thank you again to our sponsor, Den 10 Insurance Services, helping businesses get the right insurance for all their insurance needs. Visit den10.io to get a quote. That's D-E-N-T-E-N dot I-O. And remember, when you buy an insurance policy from Denton, you're giving back on a global scale. This episode was produced by Uncle Mike at the iHeart Studios in Poughkeepsie. Special thanks to Lara Rodrian for the opportunity and my team at Michael Esposito, Inc.